Hey everyone, I hope you're all having a lovely day today. If anyone isn't in the UK, then you probably won't know, but Liverpool has just gone back into lockdown. Uh, second wave, apparently. I, I don't really get what's going on anymore, to be honest. But everything's a bit hectic right now. I'm just trying to finish things off before lockdown happens. It's not full blown, you can't leave your house lockdown. There's just been more measures coming and that affects my work it affects like both of my little jobs so yeah it's just been a bit mad so i've been researching this case for ages but this is a very last minute filming of it just because i kept putting it off and yeah it's just been a hectic week but i still wanted to get a video out especially this one because i just really want to talk about it so i heard about this case about a year ago and i just really wanted to cover it straight away it is it's awful, it really is. I know usually I will tell the story in chronological order, but I'm kind of gonna, um, I hate saying like spoil it because like this is someone's life, it's not a film. But you know what I mean, I, I don't usually talk about the ending until the ending comes, but I felt that it was important to kind of touch on the whole subject of the case before I actually tell you everything that happened in the case. So within this case, there is something called an honor killing. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is all in my own words, by the way. I am in no way an expert about this kind of thing. So an honor killing is when a family member kills another family member. It's usually a man killing a woman because they have dishonored the family. And it's usually because of their religious background and things that they believe in. Absolutely horrible stuff should never happen. It's awful that it's even an option to some people. In this case, an honor killing happens within a Muslim family and in the documentary there's a man who comes out and speaks about their religion and he just says that there is absolutely nothing within that religion that supports honor killing. It is not, like you're not good enough basically to take someone else's life, it's, it's no one's job besides God's. Does that make sense? I just wanted to put that out there before I tell you about the case because this isn't a reflection on that religion. So this story starts in 1987 in Texas in the USA and it starts with a lady called Patricia or Tissy as she's sometimes known so I'll probably call her Tissy through this video. Patricia Owens or Tissy Owens. And I say lady but Tissy was actually 14 when this story begins. So Tissy became friends with the Saeed family and they were a family who'd come over from Sinai in Egypt. They worked in a convenience store near Tissy's house and there was five children in their family. A few of the brothers in the family had moved over to the USA on a student visa in 1983 and Tissy got to know them, she was friendly with them and she actually started dating one of the brothers when she was 14. She started going out with Yasin Saeed, she really liked him and he actually asked her to marry him and obviously because she was so young she needed her dad's permission and her dad agreed and signed some papers. Obviously it's extremely young to get married but her mum and dad said that it was okay, so she was all up for marrying Yassine. I'm not entirely sure of the reason why it happened, but Yassine and Tissy actually split up and they were no longer dating. Shortly after they broke up, Tissy was at Denny's with her nan and she noticed that Yassine's older brother Yasser was there and he was shouting her and kind of trying to get her attention. So her nan said to her, well, go and see what he wants. And he asked her out. He said, you know, will you go out with me? Um, do you and your nan want to meet me here tomorrow? So she was like, yeah, okay. Yasser was the oldest of all the brothers and he was 29 at this time and Tissy was just 15. So then they started dating and straight away Yasser asked her to marry him. And they'd only been going out for about a week and when her mum and dad kind of heard about this, her mum was like, I'm going to wait for a bit because you've only just started going out. And then they agreed on waiting one more week before they got married. So yes, I wanted to marry Tissy a week into them going out. And then her mum was like, no, wait another week. And I think this was more so they had time to like get stuff together, you know, like a dress and decorations. It wasn't a kind of wait a bit and see how it goes. It was just wait a bit so we can get things ready for the wedding. That's how it sounds to me anyway. Tissy said that she wasn't in love with Yasa, she just wanted to be closer to Yasin, his brother. I think that just shows that she was still, you know, really, really young. That she was willing to go through with a wedding to be close to someone she liked, but marry someone else. Tissy's dad needed some convincing over this marriage. I'm not sure why he agreed to the other one, but wasn't okay with this one. 
but Tissy's mum was all for this marriage because the Saeeds were said to have loads of land in Egypt, they had lots and lots of money and um, Yasser was always saying how well he'd treat Tissy, how she'd have everything, she wouldn't have to work, basically she'd just be treated like a queen and her family were really really up for this. Tissy said that she was so poor that she just wanted to get out of that situation at home and this just sounded like the perfect life. Tissy's sister and one of her aunties weren't too convinced. Her sister was saying that she was too young and she was ruining her life by doing this but Tissy didn't want to know. She was really really up for this marriage. Another one of Tissy's aunties actually didn't know the age difference between the two of them but she was more worried about the religious and the cultural differences between the two of them so she said please like look up everything about the religion, I'll do the flowers and everything for your wedding but in return just study the religion, make sure that it's what you want because Tissy's family were Baptists and the Saeeds were Muslim so she just said make sure you know everything about the religion, make sure that it suits you and you're happy with that. Neither of the families were particularly religious but obviously they'd been brought up with different religious backgrounds. She said she'd look this up, but her auntie said she doesn't think she ever really did. So Tissy said that the wedding was absolutely lovely, there were both the families there, they were all eating, talking, having fun, it was just a really nice celebration. At one point one of her aunties walked out into the car park, I think to get something from a car, and one of Yasser's brothers actually walked out, followed her, and asked her to marry him, and she was just like, no, are you crazy? And soon after the wedding they went to register him for his green card because he was now married, he was able to stay in the USA. Tissy said the marriage was lovely for the first six or seven months until it started going downhill and Tissy was actually pregnant as well at this time. She talks about a time when they were just playing around, they were wrestling with each other and she touched him on the back of the neck and he grabbed her by the throat and just said never touch me there. That was the first red flag for her, it was just a complete change of personality. Then he started saying that it was a mistake that he married an American because Americans weren't good people. He started saying that he'd have to raise her to be a good person because her family weren't good people and they obviously didn't love her for letting her marry him so young and just being so kind of eager to push her into that which is horrible like I can't imagine being like 15, 16 and being told all this. He wanted more control over her as time went on, he would trash the house and then make her clean it up. She dropped a cup once and he screamed at her saying never break anything in my house. He wouldn't get a job either. Tissy worked and any money that she had went to support you know the house and the family but his money if he ever did work was his. He never support of the family. And actually when they were very first married, Tissy said that they lived in a trailer, then the family said that they were going to build them a house, so she was looking forward to that, but when they did build it, it was basically a shack. They had no running water, they had dirt floors, they had to go into the woods to go to the loo, they had to have a shower under a hose. It was not the life that she'd agreed to whatsoever, and it was just, it was a nightmare by the sounds of it. Yasser also had six affairs that Tissy knows of and he also had a violent past. I heard that he fell out with one of the people he worked with, waited for him after work and then ran him over with his car and the man unfortunately passed away. At 16 years old Tissy had a little boy who they called Islam. Then at 17 they had a girl called Amina and then at 18 she had a little girl called Sarah. And Yasser had said that he wanted the children to be brought up as Muslims, which was absolutely fine, it was agreed on. But they both agreed that when the kids were older they'd be able to make their own decisions and that was all fine. So the kids were obviously growing up in America and they were just normal American teenagers. Amina was described as beautiful, funny, she liked to talk a lot, she was a social butterfly. Her phone was always going off, she loved the colour pink. She was a girly girl. Sarah was described as being a tomboy, she was always in jeans and trainers, she was a little bit more reserved and she was just always smiling. Both the girls attended martial arts classes and Sarah only went for a little bit. She was sporty but I just don't think martial arts was her thing so Amina carried it on though. Amina really liked it. When the girls were around eight or nine, I think they were with their nan, so Tissy's mum, and the nan rang Tissy and said the girls are saying that Yasser has sexually assaulted them. Amina had said to her, our dad touched us. 
So they were taken to the hospital to be examined, child protection services were called, and so were the police. And the examination said that sexual assault couldn't be ruled out, but it also couldn't be proved. So they, they basically didn't, didn't know. There was nothing to say, yeah, these girls have been assaulted, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen because without getting into too much detail, some things don't leave a trace. It's horrible to even think about. I'm not going to go into detail about what the actual accusations were just because it feels really, really weird to do that. I don't think I'm ever going to be comfortable to share details of something like that. But they left Yasa, they went to live with their nan. But Tissy said that when they were there, the phone just wouldn't stop ringing. He was constantly ringing the house, just constantly trying to get in touch. She said her dad was being followed and threatened. He was threatening the family and she was really scared. Then suddenly the girls said it didn't happen. They said that their nan had told them to say it and the charges were dropped and they moved back with Yasser. I have really mixed feelings about Tissy. On one hand, I feel so sorry for her. On the other, I just question things that she does. But I also understand how young she was married and how much she was manipulated. So yeah, my mind's all over the place with her. One of the reasons my mind's so over the place is that her interviews sometimes contradict each other. There was a photo that was shown on one of the documentaries of Yasa holding a knife up to Tissy's throat. There was another one of her posing with a gun and on one of the interviews she says, oh yeah, he forced me to do this. He held the knife up to my throat and he said, this is what happened if I ever disobeyed him and she's crying and everything. Obviously you feel awful for her, but then on another one, she goes, oh yeah, that was just like playing, that was just messing around, like it doesn't mean anything. But then it's like, was she just scared to admit it and is the sad story the truth or what? She's really, it's it's hard, it really is hard. So the Saeeds were all back together, but they did move away for a little bit so everything could kind of calm down. It was becoming clear that even though Yasser and Tissy had agreed that the children could make their own decisions once they grew up, he wanted the girls to marry Muslim men. He didn't actually mind if they were American men, but they had to be Muslim and they weren't allowed to make their own decisions. And he took Amina over to Egypt at one point and she said he heard them discussing bribe prices and that really made him mad. Like, that she just, she was being sold on basically and it was horrible for her. It's not the life that she wanted. And Amina actually had a boyfriend that her dad didn't know about. His name was Joseph and he saw Amina for the first time at Taekwondo and he said that he was doing push-ups or something and he actually messed it up because he saw her and was just like, oh my god, she is so gorgeous. He said he thought to himself, a girl that looks like that definitely has a boyfriend, but one day he was taking his shoes off, you know, to go and do some martial arts and he was putting his phone into his shoe to keep it safe and putting it in a locker and she came up to him and she went, oh, I didn't know you had a phone because this was like... I think it was like 2005-ish, so not everyone had one at that point. He said, oh yeah, I've got a phone, here it is. And she said, can I have your number? And he was absolutely made up. They started texting each other and it started out just being a little teenage relationship until it turned to I love yous and they were in a full-blown relationship. They were absolutely crazy about each other. He said he was really passionate about music and Amina had said that's what attracted her to him. Joseph said that whenever he was having a bad day, just being around Amina just made him so, so happy. He absolutely loved her and she loved him as well. And Sarah also had a boyfriend called Eric and their relationship was more of a puppy love kind of thing, but she still had a boyfriend and her dad didn't know about this. He didn't know about Amina's either and her mum knew about it but kind of kept it to herself because she really wanted them to have normal lives. Sarah wanted to be a doctor, she was really academic. They both had jobs and Amina had been made a supervisor after just two and a half weeks so she was really really clever. They were both really clever girls and they had their whole lives ahead of them. So there are so many videos and pictures of Amina and Sarah because their dad liked to film. A lot of parents film the kids growing up, going to special events, just keeping memories. And when you see these videos, it's just the girls kind of doing their own thing. They're just walking around, you know, walking through a car park or they're playing on the trampoline and they're a bit annoyed that they're being filmed. You can actually see that it's being done behind a window. 
which again, constantly giving people the benefits of the doubt, but I know that a lot of people will record the kids when they're not expecting it, you know, just trying to get a natural video of them playing. But this wasn't normal recording. I saw these videos before I'd heard about the accusations of the sexual abuse. So honestly, when I first saw these videos, the beginning of these videos, I was just like, oh, he's just recording his kids. Like, he's not doing anything wrong. However, they take a really, really creepy turn. There's a video of Amina when she's about 15 and he's zooming in on her eyes, just saying how beautiful her eyes are. And again, it's his daughter, it's just kind of like, oh, aren't you so gorgeous? But no, the way he's saying it is really creepy and she actually says in the video, like, oh, I'm gonna get sick. And then there's a video which just makes me feel ill. The two girls are just lying down in bed and they've got quilts over them. And you can hear Yasser and Islam like talking to them and he's like zooms in on one of the girl's feet and then like her like calves and he's like mm, nice legs. It just makes, it makes me feel sick. They're both just saying stop and it's kind of playful but it's like they're so used to this and he just, he keeps zooming in on their legs and telling Islam to take the quilt off them and it is just very, very horrible to watch. Mm. There's also a video of Sarah working behind the till. She's just at her job and her dad's filming it. Then you can hear a girl speaking in the car with them and it's either Amina or it's Tissy. Now to me it sounds like Amina but I've seen a lot of um, the subtitles on the video. Some say it's Amina and some say it's Tissy. So one of the girls was in the car with them, either him or, or his sister. And he's videoing her being like, she smiled at the customer and I'll just say it's Amina and Amina says it's a job that's what she's got to do and he just goes oh she's in trouble and then he says she opened up the conversation as well and then Islam is also in the car and he's just saying oh she's going to be locked in the house until she's 40. Tissy also said that he used to park at Burger King across from the school and he'd video them getting off the bus and make sure that they weren't speaking to anyone that he didn't want them to. Apparently he'd go into their room and read all their diaries and stuff and unfortunately in one of the notebooks Amina used to write notes to Joseph. What they'd do is they'd both write each other a note and then they'd swap it at the beginning of the day you know, take it home, read it, and then write another one, swap it, and it, that's how their relationship worked, basically. And Amina had been writing this letter, her dad had found it and asked her about it, and she was just like, oh, I obviously don't have a boyfriend because I'm not allowed one, but if I did, this is what I'd write, and he's imaginary, and I don't have one. So, Yasser didn't really buy it. I also heard that Yasser had bugged Amina's car, so the car had been in a crash and the airbag had been removed and he had replaced the airbag with a recording device, so whenever someone started talking in the car it would start recording. So she said if Joseph was ever in the car, or like any boy, they weren't ever able to talk, like they'd just sit in silence. So because Yasser now kind of knew that Amina was seeing someone who he hadn't chosen for her. He moved her overnight to Louisville and he still wanted to go ahead with his plan to take her to Egypt and marry her off to someone that he chose. Apparently he was choosing them but they were able to kind of say yeah or no which doesn't make it any better but he wanted to take her to Egypt to help her choose a husband basically. The one he had his eye on was apparently 40 years old that's what Amina had said in one of her letters, I think. And Joseph, Amina's boyfriend, just didn't have any contact with her until Amina was able to speak to the Taekwondo instructor through an email and let him know what had gone on and say, like, please pass the message on to Joseph. He passed the message on to Joseph's mum and dad and they had to keep the information from Joseph because they didn't want him to, you know, go out looking for her or do something silly because he was still quite young. And they were really scared of Yasser and what he would do to their son if he found out that he was the one who'd been seeing his daughter. 
So Amina and Joseph's mum were able to keep in contact through emails, but Joseph wasn't involved in any of this. Amina would be begging Joseph's mum to let them talk, but she just really didn't want them to. Eventually they were able to talk again. Joseph's mum said it was okay. Then they moved back to their normal house, but by that time the girls had had enough. They were done with this. Both of their partners had asked them to marry them, which they really wanted to do. They just wanted their own lives. They were done being controlled. They wanted to go. A couple of days before Christmas in 2007, Yasser had said that he was going to kill Amina for dating Joseph. And I think that was the last straw. So they decided that they were going to leave and Tissy actually said that she wanted to go with them. She said that she'd always wanted to leave Yasser and now was the opportunity. So Amina, Tissy, Sarah, then Amina's friend Eddie and Sarah's boyfriend Eric all went to Tissy's aunties. Tissy had said to her auntie that there was no way she would go back to Yasser after all of this because she knew that he would kill the girls and she just said like that was it. She was like we've left. Yasser and Islam filled out missing persons report. His brother was in contact with Tissy saying he doesn't understand why you've left. Um, please, like, you know, don't leave him, come back. We want to know where you are. And Tissy was just like, no, wouldn't tell them anything. Tissy wouldn't leave the kids by themselves at all. In their aunties, they were doing Mexican food and they ran out of nachos. So Tissy was asked to go to the shop, but she wouldn't let the kids stay there without her she was like no everyone has to come she just wouldn't let them out of her sight i think she was worried that they'd kind of go off without her and then she wouldn't know where they were by december the 27th in 2007 they all moved to a hotel in tulsa they all had burner phones they got jobs and stuff around there too they were really set on this being their new little start all their old phones were destroyed you know sim cards broken no way of tracing them Tissy was apparently still in contact with one of Yasser's brothers who was still begging them to go back. He was even saying, you know, if you go back and Yasser being there makes you uncomfortable, he'll leave. Like he said, he'll go. It's your house. You can do what you want. Go back there with the kids. And Tissy's sister was like, this is obviously all a trick. Please don't go back. And Amina had said to Joseph in an email that her mum was having second thoughts about leaving and that she was really worried about what was going to happen next. Tissy said to one of the girls, look, we're gonna go and stay with your auntie who lived back home. And they were panicked. They were like, no, we're not going back. Tissy said, it's just so I can lay some flowers on my mum's grave. That's all we're going for. So the girls agreed. They got in the car and they started heading back home. Somewhere along the journey, Tissy admitted that she was going back to Yasser. That's where she was taking them. Sarah and Amina were both devastated. They didn't wanna go back, but Sarah was more okay with it than Amina was and <sighs> Amina was just like absolutely no way she went to stay with a friend some sources say it's her boyfriend some sources say it was just a friend but Amina didn't stay at home for a few nights she was just like no way am I going back Sarah was back and they just kept calling her they were getting Sarah to text her Tissy was texting her her dad was bringing her just everyone was trying to convince Amina to come back home on December the 31st, Amina rang her auntie and said, did you know that my mum was going back to my dad? And her auntie was just like, no, I didn't know anything about this. I don't have your new numbers since you destroyed your old ones. I don't know anything about anything that's happening. And Amina was saying that she didn't want to go back. She'd rather die before going back. And her auntie said, you need to go and file a restraining order. I don't know if Amina actually got to do this, but the next day, they were still calling her. This was New Year's Day on 2008. Still trying to convince her to come back until she finally gave in. And she said to Joseph, um, I don't know if this was in person or by email, but she said, you know, I've got to do what I've got to do. And she agreed to go home. Tissy came and picked Amina up, took her home. And she said that when Amina walked in, Yasser was just so happy to see her. He was crying. He gave her a kiss on the head and she said that in all the time she'd been with him, she'd never seen Yasa cry and she just thought it must have meant that much to him to have his daughter home. Yasa said that he wanted to take the girls out for dinner so they were able to all talk everything out and sort things between them. And Tissy had asked to go but Yasa said, no, I just want it to be me and the girls. So she watched them all get into Yasa's taxi and go. At around half seven that night, 
this 911 call was placed. So Amina had been sat in the front of the car and Sarah had been sat in the back. Yasser had pulled the car over and shot his daughters 11 times. Somehow Sarah was able to get hold of her phone and call 911 within this time. Yasser then drove the taxi to a hotel and abandoned the car in the car park. The police didn't actually know exactly where Sarah's 911 call had been placed and also because they were in the taxi, the car was moving so they weren't able to properly track it. So they went to the house that the phone was registered to and Tissy was home. They asked where where her daughters were and she just said they were meant to be going to Denny's with their dad but obviously this had all happened. They told her about the 911 call and they took her down to the station. Tissy rang one of Yasser's brothers to see if he knew where Yasser was and where he'd taken the girls and he said he didn't know but he knew that Yasser didn't want to be raising whores for daughters. They were his exact words apparently. A half eight, another driver called 911 saying that he could see two figures in a car, it didn't have a driver but the figure in the front had blood coming from her ear and she was slumped over. It's believed that when Yasser had abandoned the taxi in the car park, one of his brothers had actually come to pick him up so he was able to get away without being seen. When Joseph, Amina's boyfriend, was told about the news, he had to go to hospital. He said he completely lost his grip on reality. He said that he made a promise to Amina that when her dad murdered her, because it was just, it was something that was coming in her eyes, which is horrible, that he wouldn't do anything to harm himself and he said that was a daily struggle for him. Tissy's also said that one of Yasser's brothers said to her after the girls' bodies were found that if it was him you wouldn't be able to find the bodies and that she's lucky that Yasser let her find the girls' bodies. Amina and Sarah were given a Christian funeral and a Muslim funeral. They had pink caskets and they had pink flowers in their hair. Tissy had them buried in a Muslim cemetery, which is fine you know, if that's what she chose. However, the cemetery was really run down and bare and a lot of the family were extremely unhappy with the girls being laid to rest there. And Yasser had gotten away. There was no trace of him leaving the country. No one knew where he was until recently. Yasser had been on the run for 12 years, but then just a few weeks ago in August, Yasser, Yasin, his brother and Islam, his son, were all arrested. So that's the most recent update of the case and I'm constantly looking for updates on what's going to happen. So that's the case of the Saeed sisters. I am, I don't even know what to say about this. It's so heartbreaking. I don't know how people can be that heartless to kill someone at all, never mind your own family. These girls had their whole lives ahead of them and they were just happy to be living and then that was taken away from them. Thank you so much for watching. I upload a new true crime video every Sunday, so please like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell, all the good stuff. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you haven't already. Thank you so much and I will see you in my next one. Sorry, my neighbours were talking like all the way through that.